Okay, so I was scrolling to the Steam discount section as I usually do, since you know I'm a frugal little shit who refuses to spend actual money, and I see a quaint little game on sale called Darkest Dungeon. Now I've heard good things about this game. Really good things. And everything including the DLCs was just $10. That's pretty frickin' good. Hey. So, like any god-fearing Catholic, I decide to spend my hard-earned shekels on this delightful little game. Little did I know, just like the ancestor, I had accidentally unleashed an eldritch abomination that's made me want to kill myself. <sighs> Welcome to Darkest Dungeon, a game that has caused me actual stress-related sleeping problems. Darkest Dungeon is a dungeon crawler turn-based roguelike RPG slash CEO simulator set in the grim darkness of the uh, 17th century, apparently. Made by the boys over at Red Hook Studios. From the moment you boot up the game, Darkest Dungeon explicitly tells you this game is not for everyone. The odds are stacked against you, this game is very time-consuming, and you will fail. It's all about making the best choices in a situation in which you are most certainly fucked, and there is always an option. Just once the player decides is better or not. You're gonna have to make some hard decisions that are definitely immoral, at least at some point in the game. However, my head ass wasn't paying attention to that. I was banging out to that sick main menu theme. Damn, this goes on. Besides, I don't need that pessimistic nonsense, okay? I am a moral, progressive man with Judeo-Christian values, and I refuse to adhere to the meta. I don't need a god. I'll play in Vanilla Darkest. It'll be fine. In the business, we call this foreshadowing. Okay then, uh, story. What is it? Alright, let me see. <clears throat> Says here, your ancestor's a cunt. Is there more lore in the world? I mean, of course there is, but you get the main premise in the beginning cutscene. Basically, your ancestor sends you a letter saying how he opened a link to Hentai Haven and the family estate on a quest for knowledge, fucked up the local city due to said link and quest, and he tells you to fix the problem because he committed funny Squid Game reference. Throughout the game, the ancestor goes on to give you gameplay tips and, uh, albeit repetitious commentary on how you're such a good nephew. The game starts out with a coach wagon crashing just outside the estate, holding Reynald and Dismas, hired men you contracted in order to begin your little crusade against evil. Uh, just to let you know, don't get too attached to them. It's a nice little tutorial to help you get acquainted with the game, and it helps set the mood. The old road ends, and finally, the game begins! Welcome to Newark. Newark is the main camp of operations, allowing you to upgrade your heroes, get some rest, or be able to get new ones over the stagecoach. Fret not, this baby's gonna get the vanilla ice treatment, as you collect heirlooms throughout the game to upgrade the town and unlock new features. But to get those heirlooms, we need to explore. After I've gone to the coach wagon to pick up some more low lifes, you can grab a party of four so you can choose a mission from the locations around the estate, from apprentice, veteran, and champion. There's also the option to go to the darkest dungeon immediately beginning the game, but I would consider that comparable to getting fucked by a horse. It's stressful, extremely painful, way too long, and it's probably better to just train and get ready instead. The entire game is basically you just training to beat the end game dungeon raids. Every resolve you gain, every upgrade you make, and every trinket you collect is helping you get that one step closer to feeling comfortable enough to let you take that horse cock. Okay, but what's the moment to moment, moment gameplay game like it's uh it's it, it it's hard it's it's very hard very very hard each run allows you to create a party of four heroes ranging from 16 different classes with each having different abilities and moves these classes include average british man that weird kid who says he's holding back his power Geralt and Yaskir, avid bat consumer fan service the meta ball do you watch it john mcafee Dog. Lives Out starring Daniel Craig. Gun. Gun but whitewashing. And avid pegging enjoyer. There's also some DLC classes, but I chose not to use those. Every class is well balanced, unique, and always has some sort of niche to be used for. Each class has 8 moves, and unless you're the abomination, you can only pick 4. Each move has different stats and effects, like curing bleeds and poisons, critical strike chance, dealing more damage to stunned enemies, dealing more damage to specific enemy types, guarding a hero from attacks, and I could legitimately go on for like another hour talking about every 
every specific move's details. With the amount of moves you could do in this game, creating a good team comp is legitimately no problem. For example, my favorite team was one that used marking targets for more damage. Some characters have specific moves that mark targets, giving them certain debuffs and allowing more damage dealt to them. I would have an Arbalist, a Cultist, a Houndmaster, and a Bounty Hunter, each able to mark different targets. Each of the class's main attack I just listed allows them to get extra damage against marked enemies, so if you all have them gang up on one big target, it recreates that one Gianni move. All the enemies have their own attacks just like yours, sometimes your hero's attacks as an enemy attack. And let me tell you, they all hit like a fucking truck. Oh my god, that's the most broken thing I've ever seen. Terrible vistas of emptiness reveal themselves. She's dead, she's literally And here's part one of why Darkest Dungeon has stripped me of my sanity. All deaths are permanent. You won't instantly die if you get 0 HP, you'll be put on death's door, which is a roll of the dice to see if you survive the next attack. But if there's no healers in your party, well then you're cucked. By the way, this game auto saves, so no reloading missions to save your characters. Trust me, I've tried. Oh, what's this? Your favorite character that you just spent 10 hours grinding for just died because the occultist got a crit zero with bleed, causing them to die on the first check of death's door? Get fucked. Liberal. Like, if there's any complaint that I have with this game, is that it just goes stupid sometimes with the RNG. I legit feel like this game is purposely targeting a character in a run just to make them die. Like, bro, look at this shit! They targeted him four times while my other guys were marked. And that's not even the hardest part of combat. No, it's dealing with stress. Healing is easy. As long as they have 1 HP, they can survive the next attack, and can potentially make it back to a healthy amount of HP. Not stress, though. Only a couple of characters have stress healing, so unless you're hitting crits like a certain French cunt, then you have to manage it hard. If you get to 100 stress, your character suffers from an affliction, which creates more problems like not being able to receive buffs, damaging other characters, or giving your characters even more stress. If you get 200 stress, your character gets a heart attack. In combat, this puts them at death's door, and if you're at 0 HP, it instantly kills you. Oh, uh, did I mention you can get stressed by just, like, walking around? Great, get 9 out of 10. 10 out of 10. Thank you, Clay. There's a small chance when hitting 100, though, you can get virtuous. Instead of getting debuffs, you give buffs and can help allies. They can help tremendously and can single-handedly carry runs. Just don't count on it happening. It's a 25% chance. Okay, so, stress can go to Belize. I get it. What can I do to reduce it? Other than making sure you have enough torches to keep you above 75 at all times, which you should do anyways for reasons that will be explained later, allowing enemies to do less stress damage towards you, and getting some laudanum if there will be enemies that will create horror debuffs, you can't do much. Even then, some heroes can give your teammates stress as well, so you have to make sure they chill the fuck out when using their moves. Honestly, the best strategy you could do in this game is be a bitch. If you have the option to, and you don't feel comfortable enough to go on, just retreat from the fight remission. It gives your guys more stress coming back, but it's better to lose some more gold than to lose everything. Okay, so let's say you got out. You completed the objective, like explore 90% of all rooms, complete all the room battles, get the fucking Tomar Emeralds, I don't care. You got the bread and dipped like a wife with child support. And just like a hoe with child support, now you have to deal with the aftermath. Welcome to the actual game, crying over having to deal with the consequences of your run. Going back to stress, and specifically afflictions, they don't go away. You have to spend money in order to reduce their stress. You can do this either with blackjack and hookers, or through the good lord. A great way of reducing my stress is smashing that like slash subscribe button. Please, every sub is another minute I can see my family. I'm so alone. Please, you gotta help me. Please. Despite how it may feel, you don't have a lot of room for your roster, and healing a full character costs almost a thousand gold. So you have to pick very carefully which character you want to help since you can't use them until the next mission is beat. You might not be able to stress heal them anyway since these Heat Miser and Snow Miser brother looking motherfuckers over here are taking the spot in the area you need, and you can't get more slots to upgrade the abbey since you need heirlooms, but you can't get heirlooms because you need to help your characters! Heroes also have the chance to come back with diseases that debuff 
them in various ways. So you need to cure them in the sanitarium. This also causes them to be locked up for a week so you can't use them in the next mission. So if your character has an affliction and three diseases, you're essentially unable to use them for at least four fucking missions. You can just kick them to the curb like a pimp when one of his prostitutes is pregnant to save money. After all, the only reliable resource is manpower the coach wagon picks up. But I, I refuse money, to let I down my man like Dennis Prager from Prager University it. YouTube channel, okay? I'm making sure these people are helped. Moral fucking run! This game also, as any good CEO simulator does, belittles you for being poor. Every area for upgrading your heroes costs gold, so you have to upgrade their abilities and their armor and weapons multiple times in order to not get completely eviscerated in higher difficulty missions. So I was forced to sell my loot for supply money to fund the next missions, which was repeated over and over over and 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 over again. Finally, I was able to get enough money to upgrade some of my guys, and finally made it to Veteran Missions. After finally getting used to the game and about 10 characters dead, it's still a mortal run, shut up. We finally reached the mid game, which honestly to me was just absolutely incredible. Mid game darkest dungeon to me just hits that perfect combo of being challenging enough to bring tension while not being too outrageous that I want to go Hi postal. There. By now I've been finding out how to strategize more, figure out what heroes I like and when to use them. I've even been more focused on being more prepared for missions, focusing on food and torches depending on what the area where to bring antidotes or bandages for DOTs, holy water and medicinal herbs to cure debuffs, and to apply resistances. Oh By now, Darkest Dungeon puts a massive importance on preparation. You get the most gamer fucking team comp that perfectly synergizes with one another, because you so happen to forget bringing shovels, have fun dealing with that bullshit. I've been choosing missions more effectively, seeing what areas to go to, and what rewards I can get from completing them. I have ascended to another form of THINKING in this game. I'm on a horror to get you! By now, all the other areas have been leveled up, unlocked, and can easily be chosen from different missions. There's the ruins, castles, and boner boys. The- the weald? The we- the weld? The veal- the veald? How, how the fuck am I saying this shit? The weald. Okay, th the weald, which is a mishmash of every other location. The cove, filled with Lovecraftian fish boys and Kanye West. And the ruins, which is filled with unfunny shit. Let's start with the ruins. The ruins are a part of the main estate, but haven't really felt the corruption of the hell portal. They are also the funniest, because skeletons. <laughs> Thing is with the spooky crew, unless you count the production of red blood cells and bone marrow, you can't bleed skeletons. And that's probably the only real annoying part. There's the courtiers, who do a shit ton of stress damage, and I mean, I guess the captains and the spearmen do big damage, but they only appear in veteran missions and honestly they're not too bad. Bring a plague doctor, an abomination, or a crusader. I, I really doesn't matter. On to the next area you unlock in my personal favorite, the weald. The whole area is filled with various parasitic, disgusting organisms, from fungal monsters to Birmingham citizens. The weald focuses on poisoning you and has a lot of protection based enemies. One of the reasons why the weald is one of my favorite is because it has a wide variety of enemy types and they don't have too much resistance to blights or bleeds. For enemy challenge, they're definitely a step up from the ruins. Ectoplasms can spawn other ectoplasms. Crones are just more annoying acolytes, but they also appear in veteran. That double fungal scratcher in artillery can lick my taint. Am I, uh, forgetting anything else? I think I'm good. Yeah. Bring a leper, a jester, and enough cures the UN sends to a small Central African nation. Alright, uh, remember Bad Piggies? Remember how it was better than Angry Birds? Yeah, I said, I'm throwing fucking hands, come at me! <clears throat> Uh, yeah, anyways, they made it into an area, it's called the Warrens. The ancestor in his quest to open the link to Hentai Haven without his parents' restrictions did some incredibly haram experiments. The pigs here represent Muslim. <coughs> which resulted in zombie pigmen from Minecraft living in your poop shoots. The Warrens is all beasts and a combination of human enemy types that's heavy on bleeds, blights, and doing some meaty fucking damage. Also, some of the enemy types here can give you diseases, which in, uh, some cases can be, uh... <coughs> questionable. The place is consistently challenging. Unless you have a handmaster, then it's easy as shit. Wretches failed 7th grade health, swanatar be schmoofin', swine choppers do big bleed, and carriers never hit attacks. Bring a houndmaster, maybe a grave robber, oh yeah, and a vestal is good here too. And now, the cove. 
Fuck the cove. I want to talk about the cove. Can we talk about the cove? I'm going to talk about the cove. The cove was created by H.P. Lovecraft himself in an attempt to regress minority rights by 62 years. The place is crawling with bastard fucking fish that won't stop bleeding my guys. They're all resistant to bleeds, they do stuns, can heal each other, debuff you badly, and have actual cursed thralls and deaths. Stingers, majors, groupers, and guardians could all eat my shorts and slip on a comically placed banana peel placed by Kamala Harris. Bring an occultist and some ibuprofen for your headache. Oh yeah, there's also like enemies in every area. Like the Birmingham citizens, uh, cultists, spiders from Minecraft. Uh, okay then, uh, back to provisions. They're great for exploration. I wanted to save talking about the dungeon crawling for later in the video because I was not ballin' and quite stupid. Not anymore though, the exploration is great. During your walks between rooms, you can find various curios that help you throughout the run or potentially hurt you. Some curios hold extra food, torches, aids, poison, bleeding, all in the same curio. You can even use your provisions to interact with curios to have different effects. Like, one time I noticed a curio I interacted with during last run, and it did oh, yes. something bad to me. So I thought to myself, okay, so it's an urn, it has remnants in it, ashes, what can I do to make it good? So I doused it in holy water because, you know, urns, they're related to funerals, and the game rewarded me for being smart by giving me some treasure. It's not just that one either, this is literally a hundred different ones you could do. It's a, such a good feature that rewards players for actually using their brains, and it gives it a good D&D &D freedom of choice feel. Love to see it. However, some interactions aren't that great. One time I was on a mission in the ruins about midway through it and we were just breezing by it. We were just schmoving through it. That was until I noticed a curio that I had not interacted with before and decided to see what it does. It tells you directly to place a torch in it if you crave the void. This was a very, very unfortunate decision on my part, and all of my party members were sucked into the background of Final Destination, and I had accidentally summoned a secret boss, the Shambler. The Shambler, for one, forces you to fight at zero torchlight, which significantly increases crit chance and stress for the enemies, and decreases dodge for your party. The Shambler also likes to shake, shake it, it up, up a little for your party, it does big bleed and stresses your party greatly, and summons little fleshlights who do the same thing, and every time they attack you, they get stronger. And since it's a boss, you can't retreat unless somebody dies or get into some affliction. Yeah, um, everyone died. Don't repeat my sins. Uh, quick side note, the Shambler can also spawn at zero torchlight, which happened to me twice in the span of four runs, for the reason to not go torchless on your first playthrough. Oh, and uh, yeah, traps and blockages exist. They can hurt you unless you deactivate the trap with a skill check or use a shovel on the blockage. Okay, so exploration is good, but what if we make it long? Oh, yeah. Well, now we can access long and medium missions, which grant better rewards and even more resolve points. The newest mechanic in these missions is the ability to camp. If you cleared out a room, you can set up a campfire in order to help buff, heal, and de-stress your party. Each character has four camp skills with varying costs, however, there's only 12 points you can spend at each campfire, so you have to choose between buffing them for combat or keeping your team not on the brink of death. There are skills that every class can use and four specific skills that go usually with the playstyle the character. Jesters are good for de-stressing others since he's supposed to entertain crowds. Crusaders are noble leaders who help buff characters. And the man-at-arms is focused on party buffs for combat training. I would say the best skills are the man-at-arms, the highwayman, and the hellions. Others are either good but situational, worthless, or just not as good as these three. One type of skill that I felt like is basically required is ambush prevention. When you rest, there's a 1 in 3 chance that enemies surprise attack you and start a battle. There's zero torch throughout the fight. They shuffle your party, and they severely increase the chance you want to punch a hole through your PC. Here's a story for you all. Unfortunately, I forgot to record the video because, uh... Yeah, I'm, I'm just dead. However, I can replace this with beautiful reimaginings. Enjoy. Okay, so I had an occultist, an abomination, a bounty hunter, and a vestal. And let me tell you, we were not doing great. We just got out of a battle and I had around four food left and a stack of torches. But we were absolutely balling. I mean, we had jewels, gold, rare treasure that would make Mike Bloomberg absolutely quake due to how beta he is. It was a long mission and I had one camp left to survive. I had enough food to eat at the camp and I had a choice to use the occultist's ambush prevention. The thing about the occultist is that 
that he is a traitor working against us, and the prevention gives 7 plus stress to all party members, and 7 was the exact amount to give my abomination a heart attack. So I just hoped to God that I would just not get an ambush. Well, guess what? God hates you and knows you slap your salami staff to Fortnite twerking compilations. Not only were all my guys low on health, not only were they all about 20 stress away from a heart attack and all afflicted, but these shotgun brigands are here because apparently I indirectly bombed a hospital to deserve this. All my characters died, I lost 30,000 gold, at least 30 air rooms, and appointed another session at the therapist. Let's get back to that gabagool. Just use the prevention skill, and if none of your characters have it, then just hope you don't have bad karma. Speaking of RNG, let's go to Quirks. Quirks, just like My Hero Academia, was made specifically to please those with extreme autism, allowing you to micromanage every single character to your heart's content. Interacting with certain curios, completing missions, or having his character stay at a stress healing area in Newark can give characters certain quirks that alternate stats, affect character decisions, and change where some characters can go to in Newark. Some quirks like the Enemy Hater series, Slugger, the many scrounger perks are all great skills that can help you in missions. Negative quirks reduce stats, make you take more stress from certain enemies, or become Romanian. You can remove or lock certain quirks, however locking and removing locked quirks costs a Scrooge McDuck level price. And as much as I would like to say I spent hours meticulously changing every single character's quirks and stats, I'm gonna be honest, I didn't touch them after 5 hours. I just felt like they were just not that big in gameplay, and I got through the game just fine. I mean honestly I feel like they could just be made into a more important part of gameplay, like, for example, the negative quirk alcoholism, which forces you to only stress heal at the bar. What if you didn't get rid of it? The more the person went to that area and was affected by it, the character could just die of alcohol poison. This could potentially be awful, and I would probably hate the system as well, but I'm just, you know, throwing out the ideas. Besides, the system does make it so you grow in a greater attachment to the character, make it seem like the character is their own special little dude, so that's cool. Another way to alternate stats for characters, which I very much enjoy, enjoyed is trinkets, rewards and treasures you could find throughout the game. In the beginning I just sold these for extra cash since, you know, yes, most of them yes. sucked, but getting the rare ones does really create cool playstyles for certain characters. There's general trinkets that can help all characters, but the real gamer trinkets are class exclusive. The Arbalist is a great example of this. Wrathful Bandana increases damage by 25%, but reduces healing skills by 50%, while Medic's Greaves gives a base increase to healing by 33%, so you could focus more into damage or be a hybrid support class. Combine this with the Prophet's Eyes, a trophy trinket only found after killing a boss which gives you more accuracy at position 4, the best position Arbalist can be in, and you'll be hitting sick quickscopes and flicks and shit. The best trinkets in the game are the Ancestral Trinkets, merchandise your ancestor left behind due to committing Sudoku. Can get his pen, which is fantastic for melee classes, his senye, which is great for tanks, and his portrait, which is great for leveling characters. What a handsome man! We call this four- There's a ton more Ancestrals though, some of which only dropped from the Shambler, so uh... Good luck with that. But you can get a majority of them from long missions on champion difficulty. Some of which my guys have already gotten to and then- Flames on the horizon. Sulfur in the air. The wolves are at the door. Oh. Oh dear. Once you get at least four characters to level five, you get a quest called Wolves at the Door that takes place in Newark. Basically, the brigands found out you don't like gorillas and they've had enough of your shit. So they decided to assault your home base led by Jocko Willink. Mr. Willink doesn't think of this as being very kind. In response to not starting the mission, he will break your shit and destroy three of your buildings like some girl who found out you can't be your gay best friend because you don't like dick. This isn't a champion mission, however. This is a darkest mission, meaning all the enemies are level six. Six, and if you leave, one of your characters will instantly die. So I decided to grind. Let my city be raided and not really feel the effects because the only area hurt was the trinket seller who I didn't really use and continued to grind. I was ready. I gathered my men. I sent my provisions. And I was feeling fucking great. However, like the ancestor once told me. Say the line! Ancestor. Remind yourself that overconfidence is a slow and insidious killer. Yeah! Because I forgot to bring shovels. <laughs> this is fine. I can deal with this. However, I soon realized 
that I could not. Remember, these are the brigands. That means we're fighting these shotgun cunts multiple times. Fortunately, all darkest missions have static, unrandomized map layout, so I was able to get to the boss quickly. I tried to heal my guys to the best of my ability, and finally, we're here. The main mechanic in the fight is that Wolf has bombs that he chucks at people to explode. I did had a man at arms at the time so I could defend people so I was good on that front. The thing with Wolf is that he doesn't have great DPS, it's his guys that he spawns that do big DPS. So while I was trying to rush Wolf, his guys are bleeding me and critting me every time. Wolf is also stressing my guys with all this Jocko screaming! Fucking hell, my guys are getting afflicted- oh my god, he's vigorous. I can- I can- Oh okay, never mind, he's dead. Oof, that's fine, we're still close. Okay, maybe my man-at-arms can beat him. I mean, Thatcher got struck by lightning, weirder things have happened. Don't you feel silly? Don't you feel stupid? Don't you feel a little ashamed? Hey, hey, uh, what's happening, forum? Sko here. So this video took a pretty long time to make, and I'm only halfway through the game. So unfortunately, I've made the executive decision to make this a two-parter. To the six people that are subscribed, I'm sorry. I just need to slice them in half in order to keep my sanity. And hey, you know, you'll get more content that won't take six months to make. Oops! You get more upload per time, and I get to play Halo Infinite. It's a win-win. And to the lovely people coming from the Darkest Dungeon subreddit. Welcome, love you guys, hope you guys are having fun with Darkest Dungeon 2. Thank you all for watching, and of course, more content to come in the future. Now if you excuse me, I'm gonna play Halo. Have a great night. Oh.